with this software you can design your own interface on the Lao computer and it spits out OSC data and I have designed an interface for a little project that I call Groove Catcher and uh, it gives me all these faders and buttons what is important of course is that you set up the proper IP addresses that is always the case with the uh, OSC communication so this machine is connected to the same network as my Mac in the junction preferences you define <coughs> how many OSC inputs you are going to use that sounds a bit vague but you have to define that because normally in Junction the way you work is that you uh, a device like a joystick has a number of sensors and if we're using OSC what you want is uh, for example if you have an XY tracking thing, then that XY will give you two sensors, the X and the Y. <coughs> that means that you have to split it up in two different OC messages. One reading the X coordinate and one reading the Y coordinate. So that's how you split out all the sensors and then you can use them in junction like any other. So you define how many messages you will need. <coughs> of course what is important is port ID to make sure that this is sending on the same port as you are listening to. Well, once you have done that, uh, you get your list. And I should actually do... Well, I already opened this setup, but for example, this is a message that doesn't do anything yet. And if you open the message editor, uh, because normally in the browser it, it looks like that, so how do you know which message to listen to? You, you select one, you click on edit, or you double click on it, and you get the message editor. And it's just to watch the monitor and say, if I move this fader, ah, so that one is called slash master a slash x, and then the value. It's cool. And then what I do is say learn. And now if we look here and I move the fade, eh? uh, sorry, that's the set. That's when I release it. So I should hold it and say learn. You can see now that this is changing. And as I told you, this is just another sensor that I can create a patch. It's very easy. So I did that for all these faders. What is interesting, I have a lot of faders which already contain just one message like this, but I also have this, and this is a group of faders. And if I touch this one, you can see that suddenly I get eight browsers. See? So what I need to do now is I say I click on learn, but now I have to select which parameter I want to use. And this is a dynamic pop-up menu that changes depending on how much parameters are being received by the message. And this says, oh, there are eight parameters, and if I want to use parameter seven, and now if I move this fader, you can see in the browser that it's changing and if I move this fader nothing happens. It's only listen to the seventh parameter. So that's how you can uh, split out this single message into eight independent sensors. That's clear I hope. <coughs> uh, once you have done that, uh, it could be that you even want to uh, send some feedback. Uh, uh, that's what I want because this is basically a sequencer. And if it runs, you can see these tiny LEDs above the screen. 
steps which are running. And that is junction which is sending OC to this device. And here in the monitor you can see that. So what actually this application uh, now does is junction sends uh, process data to Lisa, which is dealing with samples. Well, I can uh, thoroughly explain how this all works, but it's, I think that's not a good idea right now. It, this is just to show you that you can easily deal with the OC stuff. And transmit. Okay. Now, normally, in in a lot of cases, I mean, the HI MIDI and timer events are always enabled but any of the last five may be disabled. And why is that? Uh, junction tries to be as, uh, how do you say that? Least processor intensive as possible. Because this is just a tool to translate your sensor stuff. And your music application or your video stuff, that's what it's all about. And that you want to give that the, mo the most power. So the, the idea of junction is if you don't need audio tracking, you just completely disable it. And that saves a lot of CPU time. And same with the video tracking. So to switch it on, you go to the preferences. And what you see in here, is all these different settings, how many timers, what your MIDI data, uh, how many OEC messages, and here is the audio inputs. I can click on enabled, then I select my audio device, well in this case it's either built-in microphone or built-in input, and we just leave it like that. There's a sample vector um, which tells me how many samples need to be analyzed to give me a proper, proper package. The bigger the vector, the bigger the latency. The smaller the vector, the bigger the accuracy. Uh, the, the smaller the latency, but the smaller the accuracy. 256. From two inputs, the level and the pitch. <coughs> In the case of the built-in microphone, this one is mono, meaning I get identical. But if I would use a line input, uh, then I would have <coughs> a separate left and right. Ah, not today. This is a bad version. I have a good excuse. So this is now just uh, responding to the loudness of what I'm saying. And it worked pretty well, as you can see. My microphone is not too sensitive, although if I do this... Can anybody tell me why Apple, in its infinite wisdom, decided <laughs> that the best place to put a microphone is near the speaker? <laughs> I really don't understand this. Anyway, that's level. So you get a, you might say, a control signal. I could do the same thing with pitch. <coughs> I can just drag this over here. Now, instead of using level, I will use pitch. But this needs a certain level to do proper pitch detection. And uh, it works extremely well when I sing sine waves. <laughs> So, it's not your ultimate optimum pitch tracker. That was never its design goal. No, it is a way of using pitch 
as a control signal. Works pretty well with theremin. Uh, with? With theremin. Yeah. yeah. Or a flute. Yeah. yeah it's simple. But uh, to give you a, 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 a sort of a, a trial. Uh, So you can see it go up and down. So that's your pitch track. Well, as I told you, if you have an external uh, audio interface with independent microphones, each microphone will give you two control signals. I still have this sort of uh, vision of thing that's powerful. Okay, now let's suppose I also want to use video. <coughs> I go to the preferences and I enable the video. I have to select the video device. Well, my laptop has the built-in camera with a firewire connection. Those cameras also work. <coughs> uh, I know I've noticed that nowadays there are a lot of USB cameras that don't give you a live feed, which is extremely annoying. You know, you can just use it to to upload. The, the data into your computer, but no live feed. Um, anyway, the built-in eyesight works, and there are also a number of uh, webcams that work. But then they have to be sort of suitable for a Mac. And that's not with, definitely not with all webcams. You define the resolution. Why is that? Because if you use 100% resolution, you use more CPU time. It's as simple as that. And it depends really upon what you want to do with your video tracking. If you want to use it as a very rough uh, switch, you know, suppose you want to use it as a grid, depending on where you're standing on stage, something should happen. Well, then a low resolution will be fine. Uh, a, a, a clear way of using it would be you have a camera mounted on the ceiling, and that is basically uh, covering a grid on stage, and depending on your position, something happens or something gets louder or whatever. And I would always use video combined with other stuff, unless it is specifically made for an installation. And then it's very convenient that you don't have to hand out stuff to the, uh, the visitors, and they can just move around. Let's take a look at a video. So, I've defined just one object, and this is new, this is in version 5. Each object is theoretically capable of tracking up to 5 blobs. Uh, how do I define it? I have to click on the edit button or double click, and I get this extra window. And here I can adjust the video filters. And I can also define how many blobs. Let's start with just one. The, there are basically four filters. Threshold, difference, color, and denoise. The threshold <coughs> and the denoise filters are for smoothing. They are not the main filters. The two main filters to use are either the difference filter or color. So let's start with the difference filter. If I click on that, my screen goes black unless I move. And of course, this directly tells me difference. It compares the frame now with the previous frame. And if we look at the block tracking viewpoint, or object tracking, 
suddenly I see a rectangle. And now what I can do is define the smallest blob size. And this red thing here tells me a blob is being detected and it's following my hand now. And if we look here, you can see in group A all these parameters changing. First of all, detected. See if I stand still, it's zero. If I move, it goes on, you might say, it's a switch. Then we have coverage, X position, Y position, width and height. Well, the last four are obvious. And coverage is something that deals it's, it's a, you might say, a percentage of how many pixels actually fit in the criteria. It's a vague parameter, but you could say that um, if inside the rectangle we have more white, then there's more pixels that fit the criteria and then the coverage number will, be get, will get bigger. In practice, I never use this parameter <laughs> because it's useful for my garden, I have to say. Uh, because uh, because between the tiles, you can remove yeah. the weave in a very easy and elegant way. <laughs> it's, uh, those are conductive, so hmm? you can do something with that. Okay. Yeah. As a reminder, this is very sharp stuff. Don't brush your teeth with it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that was my part for today. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Virtual analog lightsaber. <laughs> virtual analog. What is? It's like a. It's. It's a virtual analog. It's like jumbo shrimp. Huh? <laughs> My name is Jason Sloan. I'm the coordinator for the sound art concentration at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, this is the first year of the concentration. Um, at MICA, concentrations are the equivalent of minors at regular at universities. Um, it's a 15 credit program that focuses primarily on using sound as a material and sound for uh, a visual artist. So we're not a conservatory, um, although we do have some, uh, we have a course in electronic music that deals with the more musicality of sound for students that would be interested in the performative aspect of it. But we also range in um, having classes that also address sound installation and sound art, which focus on less of the music, you know, musicality of, and more of um, sound as a material. 
Um, this is the, uh, f like I said, this is the first uh, year of the program, and uh, we're just, both Eric and I are really excited to um, bring um, five of our students to uh, STEIM to work on creating instruments, uh, which are going to be ultimately culminating in a live performance using the uh, electronic instruments that they create here during the uh, uh, five-day residency that we've had. I'm Eric Spangler, uh, adjunct faculty at uh, MICA, uh, teaching sound art and live electronic music. Um, and uh, I came here in October 2010 uh, for a orientation workshop. Um, and I uh, just wanted to introduce uh, my students to some of those ways of working and uh, coming up with their own ways of controlling sound in a personal way. Well, all, all of the students um, who came here uh, for this residency are working on projects that they can use in a live improvisation context. And uh, Jason and I are going to perform with them uh, in a concert here at Stein and also um, on the Vigil All Night Music Festival at MICA. Um, in my own um, time here, I'm just working on some remapping of DJ controller. So. Um, yeah, I'm also looking forward to performing with the students on Friday. Um, the time I'm spending here is just helping the students and encouraging them uh, with their residency and their projects. And I'm also working on a, uh, a live transmission art project here where I'm doing live improvisational electronic music performances um, uh, on the FM band at different times of the day um, throughout, uh, throughout the time that we're here. So um, you can turn on your radio and switch and tune to your dial. And if you hear something that may not belong there, possibly could be something I'm doing. <laughs> Sure. Uh, my name is. Oh. Good. Down here. Perfect. My name's Sean Cook. Um, I'm an interaction design and art major at MICA, um, Maryland Institute College of Art. Um, I'm a sound. Uh, I'm an electronic musician, and I'm, I'm here working on uh, um, a, an interface controller, a MIDI controller that's specific to my needs when it comes to uh, uh, my digital interface that I use. Um, right now, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm working to, to make this game controller uh, um, uh, kind of a preliminary basis for what I want to create um, in my MIDI device. So right now, I'm really just kind of um, playing with this, playing with some other things, buying some components, um, starting to, to play with the inputs of the Arduino and input what I really want to, to create sounds uh, digitally. Did that work? Um, uh, honestly, like the history as well as everybody's involvement here has been like the greatest, um, I think, knowledge that I've gleaned so far. Um, this has only been our, our third workshop. Um, we talked to Taku yesterday and, and, and Frank today with Junction, and I think it's incredible just to meet him because he created this stuff. 
So this is this is really cool to begin with. Um, but yesterday we talked to Taku a lot about um, playing and what makes a performance good and, and, and what um, a failed performance is, even regardless of whatever you're playing, um, and the, the, the responsibility of the performer. Um, and then we got kind of a, a history lesson before that. And I, I think that the history behind this place is one of the biggest daunting things. And I think... Um, biggest inspiration um, that I've gotten so far um, were the hands, Michelle's hands. And that's, that's, I think, a lot, as well as all of the other stuff that we've, we've learned is just so incredible that this place is like actually made. I think that's probably the biggest thing. We haven't really gotten too deep into um, um, learning software and, and gaining knowledge as to things. And I have played with Junction before and I've been messing with it before I came um, because there is a download on your guys' website. Um, so I've been playing with that. But um, I think the, the the history so far has been incredible. Plus Amsterdam, yeah. like second time out of the country ever, third time on a plane. This place is incredible. Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, so I see, um, I'll probably ask you just to do a little demo of what you're working on. Sure. But um, from what you have now, how do you think you'll be able to develop it so that you can come across it on Friday? Uh, I think f between now and Friday, a lot of things are going to be pretty different um, because I won't be using this this device. Um, I'm going to be creating my own, so I, and I'm thinking of using a lot of knobs, potentiometers, uh, more so, um, as well as switches with digital inputs on the Arduino itself. So so buttons like this, um, but I think I'm going to have to uh, leave out the tilt sensor that I have in here uh, right now. It's something that I really want to work with in the future. Um, and maybe if I'm able to get some parts before Friday um, for maybe an accelerometer to do something si uh, similar, or even get something similar to this and just break it and, and make my own um, from this. Um, I really haven't decided exactly the means um, that I'm going to be creating my device. Um, it's just really based off of what parts I can get. Um, but hopefully, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I don't. Yeah, uh, art school kind of prepares you for work like that, though. So I'm, I've, I've, I'll, I'll be fine. <laughs> sure. program here at Stein with Micah and um, I'm going to be working on interactive instrument using this thing that I found at the hardware store. <laughs> uh, I think it's like a grout cleaner or something. <laughs> I don't know but it has these like steel wires on the end um, and they're conductive so I'm planning on attaching them to a power source at the end of the stick and then um, putting some coils of wire along it. And um, one is going to be attached to the wires themselves and then there's going to be three on the other side um, that are attached to the power source and then I can connect the brush, the bristles of the the brush to the power source by 
holding onto the coils with my hands so it, the electricity will run through my body. Um, and then each coil will have a potentiometer on it, which is basically a knob that will control the amount of resistance um, in addition to the resistance from my body. So I'll be able to tune them, um, basically the amount of voltage running, tune the amount of voltage running through, um, and then connecting it to some patches of wires on the ground um, that will each have a different MIDI instrument attached to it. And then um, the, the amount of voltage going into that patch of wires will change the frequency of the sound, so the pitches. And um, so if I can tune the coils properly, I'll be able to supply the correct amount of voltage to get the frequencies that I want. Is it going to be a lot of electricity? <laughs> um, no, probably only about 5 volts. So yeah, yeah, I won't hurt myself. Um, and then each, yeah, each patch is going to be a different synthesizer, essentially, that I can play using this stick. And uh, it's going to be kind of like gardening. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of playing like it's kind of like playing a guitar because it's gonna each coil is like a fret or a string, and then I can tune them. And you have to, um, so you think you will have this ready um, by the Friday concert? <laughs> um, so you will have this ready. Yeah, it needs to be ready by Friday. Um, hoping to get parts today. It's Tuesday already, but um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, like Sean said, going to MICA really helps prepare for stuff like this because we have five classes a week and each one assigns a project every week or every other week. So um, since this is the only thing I'm working on right now, it actually shouldn't be that rough. Yeah, it's good being really close to the studio, and Amsterdam's pretty small, so you can ride everywhere on your bicycle, which is nice. And um, uh, out of the workshops so far, like, are you, what are you looking forward to, or Um, I think the thing that I'm most excited about is the way that Stam approaches um, building instruments. Um, I've been thinking about, after graduating, possibly um, doing something with building musical instruments um, for performances. And the way I used to look at it was there's this basic functionality that most instruments um, some instruments have and some don't. Um, and I, I was thinking maybe the most effective instrument would have as much functionality as possible. But since coming here, I realized that uh, just through lectures and talks and like learning more about their view on uh, this type of thing, that what's really important is the performative aspect of the instrument. Um, like a guitar is very um, physical and gestural and performative. And um, that's what makes it worth going to see a live musician is that type of performance. And uh, most electronic instruments are just pads of some sort with buttons or sliders or knobs. And uh, while that stuff is very functional and um, precise, it's not necessarily the best way to perform, and it's not necessarily the best instrument either. So I'm really glad that I uh, that I came here and learned their approach to uh, their how they look at what's important about an instrument, an electronic instrument. Cool. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
this chair. Between this one and this one, it will open or close. Uh, so if you put it on the on the breadboard like this, uh, then what you have to do is like one of them has to go to ground, and the other one you attach to a digital input. which are on the other side and you basically just hook them up to uh, like the second pin there so on this side you have digital mm -hmm. and they are, they are numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to 13 uh, 0 and 1 are used for the serial communication so those pins you usually don't touch uh, mm -hmm. for other things uh, and then you hook up your sensor to uh, number two. Uh, actually, the the sketch already has like a, uses the an internal resistor in the Arduino uh, to pull the value up if it's it's not pulled low. So the one one side goes to um, ground and the other just goes into the digital output? Yeah. Okay. Is that the prototype part? Great.
was some place. He was kind of close to Rembrandt Square. Oh, you walked a bit then. Wait, what's your fried sauce? Mayonnaise. It's just mayonnaise? Yeah. Okay. And I was like, could I get some fried sauce? Yeah. That's fried <laughs> sauce. <laughs> he was like, yeah, that's fried sauce. And I was like, give me fried sauce, damn it. <laughs> A real fried sauce. What do you have to do? Uh, hmm. It's kind of hard to tell at this point. Yeah, 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 no problem. <laughs> I'm drawing my controller. The controller I just built. You finished? Uh, pretty much, yeah. I just need to build a box for it uh, and put an accelerometer in it tomorrow. Um, when I get it. So, yeah, really close. Nice. Really, really close. Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. Are you fucking to the next turn? Yeah, this one works. No, 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 I saw that. I think it's a new thing to Kobe. Oh, this one? I've had it. Uh, it is new, but I've had it. Yeah, yeah, I, I got it back at home and I got it in high school. I got it for this. Sure. Um, my name is Sasha Deconic. I am a junior fiber major at MICA, and I'm working on a wearable theremin. So I do a lot of smart textile work, so most of the stuff I work with is or try and do are, are garments that are soft instruments or have components on them that make them musical. Um, so I'm working on, with soft circuitry and 
Um, sorry. Oh. From the beginning? Okay. No. Um, my name is Sasha DeKonick. I am a junior fiber major at MICA, and I'm working on a wearable theremin for my project. I do mostly smart textile work right now, and, and the garments I build are musical instruments. So all of my circuitry is soft, and I embed the electronics into the textile. Um, I have a couple samples right now, but they have some issues, so I'm trying to build one more theremin before I choose one <laughs> to go with. <laughs> Uh, sure. Um, well, this is one version, um, but it's not a soft version, and the battery lead is falling off right now. Um, but this is the one I might have to go with because I um, enlarged it and made a soft version. Where? Let's see. I enlarged the the foil pattern from the back and I cut it out of conductive fabric but I think enlarging it added a lot of resistance to it and so now it doesn't want to work <laughs> so I might try and troubleshoot this one a little bit but this one that I have a, I'm trying to figure out the circuitry for I can hopefully do em by embroidering with conductive thread um, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, I'm, my original intention is I have it as a shirt, and um, I, it's more of a gorilla performance where I'm sitting in like a public space or in the audience, and it's reacting to the people that I'm surrounded by rather than I'm just standing on a, cha on a stage, you know, waving my hand in front of my chest. So... <laughs> Uh, um, okay. My name is Andrew Scotty. I'm a junior integrated digital arts major. Sean. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Andrew Scotty. I'm a junior integrated digital arts major and sound art concentrator and um, this is my project so far basically I have this tube that I came across on the street <laughs> and I've attached some pressure sensors to it um, that will sort of uh, affect the, the pitch and the speed of a sample that I've recorded um, from around Amsterdam and also, there I'm going to eventually attach um, some uh, um, material to this to sort of turn it into like a drum head, and then I'll attach a contact mic on the inside of it. So I will be able to hit this side of the um, the piece to make noise as well as affect the uh, the pitch and make other noise as well. <laughs> and that's basically it. Uh, what kind of sounds? I basically just grabbed sounds that I, I thought were really interesting. I got um, a sound that the, the tram makes a really interesting sound when it uh, sp speeds up. This sort of like, um, I don't I can't really explain it. Uh, and I also got, um, the sound of um, uh, the uh, the crosswalk signs they make a really interesting like clicking sound and uh, I bought a bike the other day <laughs> and it's sort of old and rotting and it makes a really interesting sound when you ride it so I, I got that as well and as well as a uh, the sound of a a conch shell being played by a a little old man on a boat. <laughs> So, as well as some other things. Mm -hmm. Is it making sounds yet? Uh, yeah, it's not particularly loud. I mean, I could probably pl plug into the the mixer.
is is a MIDI note value and just keep it the same. Okay. So the MIDI note number is not changing according to the data. Okay. I don't know. It's a little confusing. Because I put all these like pins in. Yeah. And so whenever I play this now, these stop in Ableton, which is kind of weird. It like cancels them out. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, I know. Trying to figure out why it's doing that. So do you have this week connected right now? I don't know. I'm connecting it right now. Okay. Oh yeah, there it is. So move, move it. To, all right. So have you already uh, dragged the the Y pedal onto there? Um. No. The X. Well, the Y is on here. Yeah. This 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 was the the one that we figured out that I need to like this thing. Uh huh. Uh huh. So I haven't really done anything to it. Yeah. Right now, right now, the Y is mapped to something that's mapped to um, velocity, like to how loud. That's so weird. I guess I don't know. Really I start to do math. What am I finding? See, right now, like this is the base. track. Mm -hmm. on yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so and you, you it want it to be one of the most black. black. Yeah, I'd rather it be more like mm -hmm. wall. It's, it's just like Y parameter triggering the sound, and you can map the, the buttons to like turning on <laughs> different processing. Hey, where should I hold this? Okay. Uh, my name is Faith Boshin, and I am here trying to figure out the Wii remotes with Junction. And what I'm trying to do is basically build an invisible drum kit with these so that when, you know, I swing it like this, it's making a drum beat, which is probably really simple, but I've never used this program before. So that's interesting. Um, I always like learning new applications and also what I'm doing is I'm using cassette loops of pre-recorded sounds that I've gotten around Amsterdam and that's the simple part <laughs> just making cassette loops you can see that there's one loop in here right now and that's just going to be playing and I'm just playing with volume during the performance tomorrow so that's going to go in and out of my piece and I'm going in, I'm doing like a soundscape piece, and then it's going to go more into the drum beat, which is when the Wii, Wii remotes come in. And uh, yeah, so that's what I'm working on right now. I guess the, my main technical problem is uh, trying to figure out these Wii remotes by tomorrow and get them all working. Yeah, I, I'm i pretty sure. I've got, I've, got, I've got the main thing down right now, so um, also I have to make more uh, cassette loops by tomorrow, so that's going to be my project tonight. And yeah, so and. Well, I am a drummer, so that's, and I've also I've had I have a small musical background. I played flute when I was younger, so. Um, that's, I guess that's the first instrument I've ever played. And then from there, I started playing drums. I a lot of other instruments, too. But electronic music, that is fairly new to me ever since going to my school at MICA. Um, I'm a photo major, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm a video concentration. But when I was in the video department, they had a sound class that was offered. So I took that, and now Jason and Eric are making a concentration solely just for sound. And ever since that first class, I've been taking more of the sound classes at MICA and ha have been getting them to count for video credits. So that's been fun, and I've, been always, I've always tried to incorporate drumming somehow into that, in, or some sort of beat-based project within my sound work. So here it is again, coming into my work. <laughs> And also, I've just been photographing everything here. So I'm sort of doing some photo stuff as well as sound stuff here. So that's fun. And what are you recording on your cassettes? Um, 
I've been recording binaural, um, binaural with binaural microphones. I've been recording like just around this area, like walking and biking and getting the sounds of people talking, and that definitely works better with headphones. But I've I'm putting some loops on here and sort of getting like this, I guess a sound that's been recorded digitally, but then put it put back onto like this analog cassette. So it's sort of messing with the sound in a way, and I like that. And with the loop, I can just take a portion of it and um, add effects to it through Ableton. So that's fun. I still need to get some recordings of bikes and get that on a loop and see how that sounds. Um, Yeah, that's a good idea. I think I'm just going to come up to the street here, the, the next street up. There's a lot of people that ride by, and there's no cars because there's no room for a car. <laughs> uh, what have you been excited to learn about here at um, I actually didn't know what to expect, um, but what I'm excited about right now is this Arduino that I have hooked up. Well, it's not hooked up right now, but I've never used the Arduino microcontroller before. And in the workshop yesterday, we slowly went through how to hook up all these knobs. So now I have these knobs generating different sounds and different tones, um, like bass tones and stuff. And I guess that's what I'm mainly excited about because I've never used this microcontroller before. And I know nothing about them, but yet I'm using it. So, <laughs> so the, I, but coming here, I honestly didn't know what I was doing other than I knew I was gonna use tape cassettes. Cassette loops, yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>